Good morning. It is so good to see every single one of you this morning. It's good to see your smiling faces. And you know, every time uh, we come together, I'm reminded that uh, God is here, that God is good. And I think it's appropriate that we start out the week this way. You know, sometimes we talk about the beginning of the week being on a Monday, but the Bible says the first day of the week is on Sunday, right? And so we begin the week together. We begin the week uh, giving us a perspective on, uh, on life and on the things that are important and especially on the presence of God that goes with us throughout the week. And I know that the Christians uh, throughout the world and throughout the ages have always needed to be reminded of this at the uh, beginning of the week. Take your Bibles into Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at the very last beatitude uh, that Jesus gives us in Matthew chapter 5. And uh, I want to park on this because this is not something that people usually think of when they think of, at least here in, in our experience. People usually don't think of this as a sign of blessedness. So go to verse 10 of Matthew chapter 5. And notice Jesus says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now this beatitude serves kind of like a bookend. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what he said at the very first beatitude. Remember, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, or the humiliated, or the nobodies, the people that are marginalized. Blessed are those because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And now he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now let me ask you the question, what do you normally think of when you hear the phrase persecuted for Christ? Now some of us may have had uh, different kinds of experiences, negative experiences because of our faith in Christ, because of our righteousness, because of the things that we value. It might uh, amount to ridicule, exclusion, a snide remark, being passed over for something. And, uh, and, and we shouldn't be surprised when we see that happen as we, uh, as we look at the text this morning and, and reflect on it. But you know there are other Christians around the world that maybe something else might come in mind. Let's continue to read. Verse 11. He says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. <laughs> Rejoice! And be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Consider what these Christians, what these people who are followers of Christ, these early Christians, consider what they experienced when uh, they decided to follow Christ. You know, if you became a Christian during the time of Jesus or in the years after Jesus left this earth, life probably for many people got very difficult. Christians faced all kinds of challenges and difficulties in almost every area of life. There was the difficulty in their work. And if somebody was a Christian and uh, became a Christian, it might affect the way they did business. It might affect the way that they did their work. They might maybe face with a choice of whether I'm going to make a living or whether I'm going to be loyal to Christ. For instance, if I was a carpenter, and maybe before a large part of my business might have been building pagan temples, and now you're a Christian saying, man, I don't know if I should be doing that anymore. Or maybe if you were a person who made garments, it was uh, making garments for the pagan priest, and maybe... Uh, when you become a Christian, you decide, well, I can't do that anymore, not if I'm going to be loyal to Christ. If you were a member of a trade guild, you might face difficulties there because when you go to the guild meetings, guess what? Every guild had their patron god, and the meetings always began with some sort of worship or sacrifice to that, uh, to that pagan god, and, of course, a Christian was not going to participate in that either. And so it was hard to make a living in the ancient world if you were Christian because idolatry was practically everywhere in every part of life. You know, they also faced difficulties in their social life. Idolatry was everywhere, even in social life. And so if you got invited to a uh, feast, we probably would say potluck, but if you got invited to some kind of meal and you would receive the invitation and it would say something like, 
I invite you to dine with me at the table of our Lord Seraphis or some other pagan god. And it always involved a uh, sacrifice to that god. And so uh, Christians, of course, would not participate in something like that. Even ordinary meals in, in one another's homes had the same problem. They usually began with some kind of a sacrifice poured out in honor of the gods of the house. And, of course, Christians would wouldn't participate in that as well. There are also difficulties even at home. What happens when only one member of the family decides to become a Christian? We can't celebrate these feasts anymore. We can't have family meals together anymore. There's no honoring of the family gods and oftentimes other family members could not understand the stubbornness of the one family member who became a Christian who no longer is going to honor the family gods. And Jesus warned that if you follow me, sometimes it's going to wind up putting brother against brother and sister against sister and so forth. But you know, there are also difficulties with the governing authorities. You know, Rome was actually fairly tolerant of all the religions under its reign as long as long as long as you performed your duty under Roman rule and would go once a year to the temple of Caesar and offer up some incense and declare Caesar is Lord. And if you did that, you can go ahead and do whatever else you wanted. And so uh, Everyone didn't seem to have a problem with that. They went ahead and worshipped their other gods and also said Caesar is Lord, except for those Christians. Jesus is Lord, and they would not declare anyone else as Lord. And, and uh, a lot of people viewed Christians with suspicion at best because Christians refused to do this. Because you see, this idea of Caesar worship helped to unify the empire it uh, was a test of loyalty to the empire. And because of this uh, solidarity around Caesar as Lord, it meant that there was a social stability and, and, and social uh, peace. And because of this, uh, this Roman peace, people were able to conduct business. It was good for business. It was good for life. And anything that was seen to threaten that peace was viewed with suspicion at best. And it's, So is it any wonder that Christians were viewed as being dangerous to society because they flatly refused to declare Caesar as Lord. Jesus is Lord. And because of all this, people were all too willing to believe the worst things about Christians. It's easy to see why Christians became Nero's scapegoat for that fire that nearly destroyed Rome. He blamed it on those Christians. People were ready to believe that Christians were guilty of some sort of gross immorality when they met together behind closed doors. Because Christians, when they got together and had their potlucks, they called it the love feast. And of course, all kinds of rumors abounded about what this love feast really was. They accused Christians of being cannibals. You know, I heard when those Christians came together, they were eating somebody's body and drinking somebody's blood. They're cannibals. They were actually accused of being atheists. Can you imagine that? Christians of all people were referred to regularly as atheists. And the reason is because they refused to acknowledge all of the traditional Roman gods. Therefore, they're atheists. Oh, and those Christians, they don't have temples. There are no temples. There are no idols. There's nothing like what, what people would associate with their religion. And so Christians were accused of being atheists. Christians were also accused of being bad for business. Lots of times people, when they became Christians, they no longer would... Uh, engage in making articles and trinkets and things for the pagan temples. They would burn their books on uh, pagan idolatry and witchcraft and so forth. And so uh, much of business in, in the ancient world was connected to pagan temples. And so Christians were seen as being bad for business. They're also seen as home wreckers because oftentimes uh, Jesus, at, at Jesus would wind up coming between family members because uh, somebody would have if they were faced with a choice, do I choose my family or do I choose Christ, they would choose Christ. And so sometimes families were split right down the middle. And so Christians were seen as social misfits, obstinate, immoral, disrespectful, disloyal, dangerous, and of course nobody, I don't think, views Christians that way these days, do they? So this has been something that's been around from the very beginning. And the penalties oftentimes were excruciating. Sometimes Christians were tortured with unimaginable horrors. They may have been burned at the stake. 
Maybe they were tortured on the rack, scraped with pincers. Sometimes they would sew them into animal skins and stick the dogs on them. Sometimes they would pour uh, uh, melted metal on them or dip them in a vat of boiling oil. Or they would put red-hot metal plates on sensitive parts of their body. Or they would cut off parts of the body then roast it before their eyes. And it's been said that the Nero actually took a bunch of Christians and covered them Christians and covered them with pitch and he crucified them in his garden and lit them on fire and used them as night lighting to drive his chariots through. And so, these would have been some of the things perhaps that some early Christians thought of when they heard the phrase persecuted for Christ. And this type of persecution is actually still a reality to some Christians around the world. You don't often hear it reported uh, in the news, but if you take up publications like Voices of the Martyr, you'll read some of the heart-wrenching stories about Christians in other parts of the world, especially, especially in Africa and in the Middle East. And so the question may come up, how is this a blessing? Jesus says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And there's the reason. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, one of the indications of being in the kingdom of God and no longer the kingdom of the world is persecution. John chapter 15 and verse 19, Jesus said, If you love the world, the world will love you. But since you are not of the world, the world hates you, and the world hates you because it hated me first. So if we're following after Christ and the world hated Christ, then Jesus reminds us the world is going to hate you as well. Luke chapter 6 and verse 26, he says, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. When all people everywhere love you and nobody has anything negative to think about you, he said, Woe to you because that's exactly how they treated the false prophets. They tickled people's ear. They went along with the flow. They uh, told people what they wanted to hear, uh, even if the truth was contrary to the way people were living their lives. And when they did that, oh yes, they were very popular with the people. And Jesus says, woe to you when that happens. We are different. We're no longer of this world. We belong to another kingdom. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4 with me, if you would. And... uh, Peter has a lot to say about persecution, and especially in chapter 4 of 1 Peter. And so read these words with me, if you would. Beginning of chapter 4 of 1 Peter. It says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Okay, if you no longer walk according to the path of this world, he said you've ceased from sin, and if you suffer in the same way that Christ has, it's because you're walking with Christ. Verse 2, So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Verse 3, For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation. And they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And so suffering is an indication, this type of suffering. Persecution is an indication that you no longer walk the way that you used to walk. So it goes on to say say in verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. It's very tempting to think that if people hate me that I have done something wrong. But were there people that hated Jesus? Was it because he did anything wrong? It was because he was doing something right and their deeds were evil. And so if we're following his steps, Peter's saying, don't think that some strange, weird thing was happening to you. 
But in verse 13 he says, But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that you also so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So we're standing with Christ and the only blessing that we'll find is in Christ. Remember that there's a contrast here when we read the Beatitudes. We can have a, just for a small time what appears to be a blessing that will pass away and wind up, wind up becoming a curse in the end, or we can stand with Christ and be blessed for eternity. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it goes on and tells us how not to suffer. Verse 15, not all suffering is good suffering. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, or thief, or evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed. He is not to be ashamed. He is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. The world will want to shame you. The world will want you to get you to hang your head as though somehow you were doing something wrong. You're not getting with the program. But Jesus says, do not be ashamed because we're standing with Christ. You know, uh, I think uh, there were a group of 40 soldiers that understood this long time ago, 320 A.D., a group of 40 soldiers in the 12th Legion of the Roman Army that winter heard an edict that had come down from the Emperor Licinius to sacrifice, sacrifice to the pagan, pagan gods. Everyone else went down and did as the edict commanded to sacrifice to the pagan gods, but these 40 soldiers who had become Christians refused to do so. And they actually went to their captain to tell them that they could not do this and to explain why they could not do this. And they told them, you can have our armor and our bodies, but our allegiance belongs to Christ. And the captain did everything that he could to try and get them to sacrifice to the gods. He tried to get them to renounce their faith in Christ. He warned them of the dishonor as a Roman to refuse an edict of the king. He whipped them, he flogged them, he had them uh, uh, put in jail. And finally, when he realized that nothing was going to change their mind, he stripped them completely naked, placed them in the middle of a frozen pond in the middle of the wintertime, and they were to stay there until they were dead. Or, if they decided to renounce Christ and sacrifice to the gods, there actually was a warm bath waiting right close by. So what, what are you going to do? You're going to freeze to death on that pond or are you going to go ahead and do as the king has ordered and enjoy this warm bath? Not one of those 40 left their huddle in the middle of the pond. Throughout the night, they encouraged each other. They sang hymns. But one by one, as the night wore on, the cold took its toll on each one of them. And then in the morning, the captain had their bodies, some of whom were actually still barely alive, taken and burned to death. And you know, this had such an impact on some of the other soldiers that were there. They secretly decided that they themselves would become Christians. And that really was an unusual, an, an unusual, an unusual thing to happen. That's the reason why people call folks like that martyrs. The word means witness. And so the people saw their, their faith and their devotion to Christ and it moved them in some way that they themselves began to uh, investigate the claims of Christ. And as hard as people tried to wipe them out, every time they tried harder, it seemed to have just the opposite effect. When we are persecuted for Christ, it's because we have the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us that the time will come when all rule all power and all authority will be abolished. It'll be done away with. It'll be destroyed. It'll be abolished. But the kingdom of God, that's where we are. The kingdom of God will last for all of eternity. Blessed are the, those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the last point I want to make is simply this. When this happens, when this happens, you are in good company. 
We stand with the best of the best. We stand with the faithful brethren around the world. We stand with the faithful prophets. We stand ultimately with our Lord. He was treated in the same way. <coughs> Look what the scriptures have to say. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 uses uh, this whole chapter is about faith and it uses Moses as an example <coughs> verse 23 by faith Moses when he was born was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict by faith Moses when he had grown up refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches <coughs> than all the treasures of Egypt, he was looking forward to the reward. All of this stuff... You decide to go with the flow and you decide to fit in and you decide to, uh, to act in such a way that no one's going to give you a hard time. Maybe you keep your faith a secret. Okay, it's a secret, but when I'm out in public, I'm not going to do anything that makes me look like a Christian. The text says that is passing. That is temporary. The thing that remains is the kingdom of God looking toward the reward. When you stand with Christ and you stand with his people, you're in good company. <coughs> Paul sometimes referred to in Philippians chapter 3 the, 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 the fellowship of the suffering of Christ. You know, one day I was reading through that passage and it just jumped out at me. You know, I thought of, of all of these expressions of fellowship, you know, where you eat together and you go out and you share the gospel together or uh, sit around the Lord, uh, come around the Lord's table together. I think, thought of all these expressions of fellowship, but one of the things I never thought of was the fellowship of His suffering. There's a reason why sometimes the Bible refers to the church as the army of the Lord. We are a fellowship, and we suffer in serve. Sometimes we suffer in serving Christ together. And there's nothing, I don't think there's a stronger expression of fellowship than when you suffer together for the same purpose and the same cause. Paul says, I want the fellowship of his suffering. Fellowship with Christ is not necessarily a life of ease, but unlike the suffering of eternal death, the suffering that we go through on this earth is only just for a little while. Just for a little while. You know, there's a minister from uh, Texas that did a uh, summer missions trip in Malaysia and was preaching at a service, and a teen girl came to be baptized. And as he was getting ready to baptize her, he noticed in the back of the room was a bunch of suitcases. wasn't there before. And he asked about it. Ask one of the members there about the suitcase, of those suitcases. So where do they come from? Who, who, whose are they? And they said, well, that belongs to that girl there that you're getting ready to be to, to baptize. I said, what? And they went on to explain that this girl was told by her parents that if you go to that meeting and if you're baptized and you become a Christian, you, then you are no longer our daughter. And so she packed her bags and went to be baptized and follow Christ. And she was in good company. She lost her family that day, but she gained the family of God. And they surrounded her with love, compassion, and support. And one of the families in the church took her into their own home because that's what the family of God does. Oh, if she had not done that, she could have probably made life a little bit easier for herself but that would only have been temporary. And she gave that up in order to gain what is eternal and what nobody can take away from her. When you are persecuted for Christ, you are in good company. You gain all the joy and the peace and the freedom that comes with standing with Christ. You stand with the prophets. You stand with the martyrs. 
you stand with the brethren who are persecuted all over the world. And someday Christ will come again. And when you look back on all of it, it'll be just a drop in the bucket. The scripture reading this morning reminded us, 2 Corinthians 4.17, momentary, momentary, momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. It's momentary, it's light, it's temporary, it will pass. And what's coming isn't even worthy to be compared with what we go through here. And what we gain, nothing, nothing can take it away. Oh, the blessedness of those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, Jesus never uh, tried to paint a rosy picture. He was always very, very realistic about what it means to follow him. At the same time, he reminded us of the greatness of the reward waiting for us. No matter how much we give up, no matter how much we go through, no matter how much difficulty we may have with an employer, no matter how much difficult, difficulty we may have with a difficult neighbor, no matter how much difficulty we may have with family members, with neighbors, with former friends because of our faith in Christ, what is coming and what's waiting for us in the eternal kingdom of God isn't worthy to be compared with the difficulty that we face here. I want to close this morning with a reading from John chapter 16. I want you to listen to these words. John chapter 16, beginning with verse 19. Listen to these words. Okay, beginning with verse uh, John chapter 16, verse 19. Jesus says, Are you deliberating together about this that I said, A little while and you will not see me, and a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice. You will grieve but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour, her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child... She no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again. And your heart, your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. No one will will take your joy away from you. If you need to respond to the invitation, please come as we sing and sing.